looking at chapter two, and uh, I have a handout now that we're allowed to do, so you could follow the scripture in that, or you could look on the board. This thing seems to be working right now, but if it flickers off, then it does. Uh, so let me uh, just read through that again. I'm not going to go through it in detail. We did that last week, but uh, it's so important. This is uh, s- these key things in Hebrews that I think are very important for uh, all of us to know. Um, let me read it. Uh, for this reason, and uh, for the reason uh, in the prior scripture, he was talking about how uh, angels are not the point of God's plan for this earth. Angels are ministers that help God uh, for his plan to bring us to glory, to bring us to the knowledge of salvation and to grow us in the Lord that we might live a life that reflects him as I always think of myself as a broken mirror, try to keep it clean, try to be pure so that that reflection of God would maybe be shared with other people. So he said, for this reason, we must pay closer attention. I I wrote a thing across the scripture here that said, I'm serious, I'm serious, that God would say I'm serious on this. You know, there's a lot of scriptures that we have fun with and everything. um, So he said, for this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard so that we do not drift from it. Um, and I wrote on the bottom of the page, if you examined a hundred people who had lost their faith in Christianity, I wonder how many of them would turn out to have been reasoned out of it by honest argument. Do, mo- do not most people simply drift without even knowing? And, uh, and I had a little thing I wanted to read. It's a uh, little story about an uh, explorer by the name of Edward Perry. And he took a crew to the Arctic Ocean, and they were endeavoring, endeavoring to move further north in some of their chartings. And so they charted their location by the stars, and they started a very difficult and very treacherous march north. So this is Antarctica. They walked and they walked hour upon hour uh, for multiple hours, and finally in weariness, being totally exhausted, they stopped, and all the walking north And they took their bearings again from the stars, and they found out when they checked the stars that they were farther south than they were when they started. And they discovered that they had been walking on an ice floe going south faster than they were walking north. Um, The culture culture that we have now is, is continuously going south. If we want to go north, it's continuously moving south. If we don't uh, butt against it, if we just uh, are comfortable, we may think we're walking for the Lord and making progress, but we're just drifting along with the culture. And of course, you know, the culture uh, today, I mean, it's made up in the world, uh, Satan and our human nature, those three things. And so uh, we have to be Steadfast, we have to be, you know, there's places in the Bible that talks about walking with God because that's a relationship. But most of the time, Paul talks about running. And, you know, I'm not ready to run. Uh, but, but in terms of a metaphor for our lives with Christ, to, to, to run towards him. And that means it takes passion. I don't know if you remember when I did a sermon uh, not too long ago, I was talking about... Uh, a friend who who did trail biking and he rode he did off-road stuff he was learning it and he came to this one place where if you can imagine just these these huge boulders just one next to the other and deep crevices between the boulders and they came to that in their trail bike now the tires are wide but they're not that wide they're like you know that wide and he asked his, his instructor he said I could go through trails, I could go through woods. He said, but what do you do there? Because if I start riding, my tires are gonna fall into the bottom uh, between the rocks. And his answer was, I think it's three words, maybe four. 
you got to go fast. In other words, you can't take that slow. You're going to get nowhere. You're going to get stuck. And I think when we hear the word from Paul and we heard it from Christ and all that, you know, they're, they're not saying, you know, take it easy, you know, get a little bit here and there and move forward. They're saying you've got to go. You've got to go with all your passion and all your desires and your desire especially uh, to, to be with Christ and to, and to, um, and to run to him. And so um, we, you know, as this scripture tells us, don't drift away. There's a lot of ways of drifting. Um, uh, and it says, for if the word spoken through angels, which the Jews that were hearing this, the Jewish Christians were hearing this, um, they, they knew that angels were very important in bringing the law and doing all of those kind of things that they had in the Old Testament. And he says, if, if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, and I went through those last week, you know. Uh, you could even look in sort of an Ananias and Sapphira and they lied and uh, you couldn't touch the mountain and, you know, when God would come to the mountain and you couldn't touch the ark and you couldn't, you know, they had sins that were uh, omission sins commission sins things you didn't do that you should have done is a sin things that you're doing that you shouldn't have done could be a sin uh, things that you did on purpose and of course things that were just a mistake they were all punished every one of them and that's a that's just a it points to God is patient if we're not getting punished because of those it's because he's patient and of course, when we're in Christ, we know that he looks at Christ and not at, uh, at us. But the point is, in Christ, and if we start drifting away and acting as though we don't know Christ, we're doing our own thing, we have to be, be careful. It said, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Some of the translations say, ignore um, a great salvation and um, and then it goes on after it was first spoken through the Lord uh, it was confirmed to us by the apostles what they're saying so whoever this is is probably a second generation Christian you know it wouldn't be Paul because Paul said I heard directly from the Lord but these people are saying well we heard it from them so this can't be Paul as I mentioned before we don't really know who it is and as long as, you know, God doesn't tell us, then that's fine. It's good enough for us to know. Um, so, and it was confirmed to us by those who heard. And at the same time, God testified with them by signs, wonders, miracles, gifts of the Holy Spirit. The, the, you know, the apostles had that opportunity to, to heal and do all those things because that when Jesus was resurrected, he left that in their hands, the evangelism, to tell people, to share the gospel. And people needed to know that was from God. And so all of these miracles and wonders would, would happen. Uh, and so, uh, and by various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So um, we can't neglect uh, anything about what Christ wants us to do. Um, so what I, what I mentioned, and of course in Hebrews 10, it says the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall in the hands of the living God. It's just a warning. It's one of his five warnings he's going to give us, uh, maybe seven, uh, in, in Hebrews. And so, um, and so with that, I, it brings up to mind people that ignored something that Jesus gave uh, he gave an example of that. And if you remember in the, the banquet, the, the great banquet in Luke uh, chapter 14, you'll probably remember it, but it's a man was having a big dinner. He invited many people. He sent his slave to, to say to those who had been invited, come for everything is ready. And they all alike began to make excuses. And if you remember, the one said, well, I just bought a piece of land and I got to go check it out, can't come. 
Another one said, I bought five yoke of oxen. I got to try them out before I, you know, go any further. Uh, but I don't know a Jewish guy that wouldn't have tried something out before he bought it. Now, that's not a slight or anything, but that, you know. Uh, another one said, well, I married a wife. Okay, so my, my wife won't let me come. Okay, that's another one. All right. And uh, so then he came back and reported it to the master of the household. And, of course, he was angry. And he said, go out in the streets and lanes of the city. Uh, here, go to the poor and the crippled, the blind and the lame. Tell them there's still room. Let them come in. And uh, the master said, uh, go out and do that. And then uh, after that, uh, you know, he, he said, I'll tell you, none of those uh, who were initially invited will taste of my dinner. And it goes on and on from there. But then later on, large crowds were growing. And Jesus said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even his own life, they can't be my disciple. That's pretty strong. I mean, that, that's, you know, he's not suggesting that you follow the Lord. He's saying, I've got to be first before all of those things, before your oxen, before your wife, before all of these things, I've got to come first. And I think that's what uh, uh, this is talking about in, in this first section. Now, the other uh, thing that Jesus talked about that has to do with uh, not drifting and being serious about our Christianity is <clears throat> when he tells... Um, the story in uh, Luke 14 about building a tower or if you're going to go against an army, you want to make sure you've counted the cost. Now, I don't know how many in the past, and I, I don't, again, I don't want to slander anybody, but how many evangelists have talked to people and said, now, you need to come to the Lord, but remember, there's a cost. There is. There's a, you have to give up your life for Christ. And when those things, com, you know, come against each other, you've got to choose Christ. And I want you to let you know so that you know what your commitment is to God. But too often they didn't say that. And then when people got into an area of persecution or a, a challenge, uh, this one example uh, that I had, um, this man was talking to a lady uh, of ill repute and um, and he convinced her that she needs to come to Christ. And so she prayed and she said, you know, I want Christ in my life. And the, and the, and the minister said, that's great. You know that black book you got? Let's burn it together. She wouldn't do it. She wouldn't burn because that was all of her clients. That was her life. And finally they had discussions and finally she says, I guess I really don't want Christ, do I? And she walked away with her black book. Now, we don't always get that when we first come and when we hear a pastor, we hear an evangelist. That doesn't, you know, it doesn't pop out at us. It happens later on. And that's why so many people, it seemed, drift away. Because they drift into whatever they were doing before that was not, that was sinful. And just like the woman, she didn't want to give up her black book. And then we have the other um, story that I promised last week that we'd talk about a little bit, <clears throat> and that's the story of the soils, you know, uh, where it talks about a man goes out and he throws seed, and they, it falls in different places. Now, some people just take that and say, well, that's, that's just evangelism, and a person is either that seed or that seed, but I would say to you that I believe that all through our life, we can, have, we can have good soil, or we can have rocky soil, or we can let the soil uh, get, choke out our faith because we're paying attention to the culture and to the world. You have the rocky soil that when they hear it, they receive it with joy, and these have no firm root, and they're full of temptation, and next thing they're, they're drifted. Or a seed that fell among thorns, uh, they get choked out with the worries and the riches and the pleasures of the world. And then they drift. And uh, now I'm not saying by any means that anyone loses their salvation. But this book has been the topic 
of many theologians on whether or not you can lose your salvation because of the harsh words in there. I don't believe you can, and I'll show you when we get to those spots what I really think it means. But it is just so, it, it's, it's, it brings down judgment uh, on us. And then, of course, uh, if you have no fruit, you have to ask yourself, are you a disciple? Now, fruit can be the fruits of the Spirit, you know, and how you act, a joy and, uh, and kindness and love and all of those kind of things, as well as the fruit of witnessing and talking to other people and shining God's light on other people. Um, but those who bear no fruit need to ask themselves whether they really are a disciple. There was a time in my life that I, I, I thought being a Christian was one thing and being a disciple was a super Christian. You know, like you could be a Christian without really being a disciple. Well, I, I've come to realize, no, you can't. It's one in the same. And Jesus gave some pretty strong rhetoric around this. You know, you got to lose your life for me, you know. And so uh, all of these things, uh, it just kind of come uh, together, at least in my mind, when, when I read uh, this first section of, uh, of Hebrews. Is there any questions on that before I move to the next little section? Okay. If you do after class, let me see if I can get it here. Okay, I think we went through that. And then I showed you this, okay? And uh, once again, uh, you, should have, you could have a copy of it, hard copy if you needed it. Uh, this, you know, um, kind of depicts the, the, the groups of people that I believe that we see uh, out in the world. We see some who who are completely against Christ and they don't make any bones about it. They are very sarcastic and they mock Christians and so forth, okay? We know where they are. They know where they are, all right? But then you get into uh, another group that heard the gospel and just because of apathy, they have rejected it. They will never say, I reject the gospel. In fact, they may go to church, but they're so apathetic about it meaning anything in their life that it is a rejection. You know, you could be a murderer, you're a rejecter. You can be a gospeler, you're a rejecter. You can just be apathetic to Christ. You never get into the word. You never understand what it means by putting yourself last and putting Christ first in your life. You never get any of that. And yet, maybe some of them still go to church because of some other reason, social reason or, or others. And then you have one which I, I call the professed, those that intellectually are convinced. I was that way many years ago. That doesn't mean, I don't know if I was saved. All I'm saying is it, it got to my heart about 20 years ago. It came to my heart, from my mind to my heart. And there's a lot of people that are seeking. We call them seekers. Maybe intellectually, it makes a lot of sense. The gospel, I mean, where else are you going to go? You know, like the, the, the apostles said, well, where else can I go for the words of life? And they realize the only one place, it's in the word of God. But it hasn't entered their hearts yet. They're not bearing fruit and so forth. And then there's the religious. They, 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 maybe they were religious in one way and now they're religious uh, in Christianity uh, and they're religious because it's a cultural right thing to do. Now the one thing that's going on in America now is that culture has changed, right? It used to be, let's call it 50 years ago, it was right. Everyone understood on Sundays what you did, okay? In fact, a lot of businesses would not open on Sundays. Uh, and people knew what Sunday meant. Uh, people understood more about Christianity. Some people wrote books that says, well, Christianity is now, you know, this is post-Christianity in this world. It's not post-Christianity. 
it's post-cultural. Christianity used to be part of the culture, and now they separated. Okay, so now it seems like you know the difference between uh, go coasting along in a little rowboat in a river that's flowing, and then putting down your anchor or your your paddle, and it's just pushing against you. Okay, back then uh, it wasn't coasting anywhere. You were okay. Okay, as cultural. You were a cultural Christian back then. Maybe you were a real Christian back then. But today, if you profess Christianity, now you put that anchor down, and boy, that water is hitting you every day. And I think that's the difference between then and now. And I don't think we have any fewer Christians now than we did then. I think it was the thing to do then, and it's not the thing to do now. Okay. Uh, and, you know, anybody can argue with me on that. That's, you know, not gospel. That's just from me. Um, and then you have, of course, the born-again believer. And I knew that that happened to me. I knew I was born again. I was drifted. I, I was drifted for about 10 years. Uh, we didn't go to church. We, you know, never thought uh, about Christ. I wasn't praying, all of that. And then a, 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 a number of things happened and things were taken away. And I didn't, um, they weren't given back to me yet, but I wanted God so bad in my life. I wanted the Bible, you know, I gave away a bunch of my seminary books. I wanted to read, I wanted to do something. And I remember making God a promise, and not that he had to do anything for it, but you know, I thanked him and I said, I will minister in whatever way it's one person I will minister to and uh, it was an important part of my life it was in my heart in my heart so um, I knew I was a born-again believer okay now saying you're a born-again believer is a redundancy it, it, a believer is born again so there's no difference there all I'm saying is I was a Christian that needed to bear fruit and was following Christ and I took every opportunity to listen to the word, and I, hopefully I still do uh, from that. And then I put a little red mark up there that says persecution reveals. It is a revealer. And I believe persecution, if, you, if I went back and talked one-on-one -on -one to each of you and said, when did things, when did you really grow closer to God in your life? You would probably tell me I was suffering. Something I was going through in my life Maybe it was children, maybe it was uh, physical, maybe it was husband, wife, maybe it was something going on uh, that drew you closer to God. And God uses suffering, and we don't like to hear the word, but Christ suffered a lot. He suffered in his daily walk because people were constantly against him. You know, he had no no good times where everyone was okay. I'm sure he had some high, very highlights and things like that. But um, when we're in this world, and th this is kind of a, this is a Paul thought, okay, but just from my experience in this world, it appears since suffering really does help us grow closer to God, when all we look for is pleasures of this life, and we don't get it, we get it once in a while, but with every waking minute, and I know that now, my age, something hurts. So it, it may be a little suffering, but it's a suffering, okay? And I, it's always reminded. You know, I never wake up and, and boom, things happen in my body that make me just feel so good. It just doesn't happen. But if I don't expect pleasures in this life, then I will take what God gives me. And, you know, people have... Um, issues of um, something happened maybe to a, a brother or sister whatever and you know get angry with God and everything like that but the bigger picture is we're not here for our extreme happiness we're here for joy we're here for peace but we are going to suffer in that regard and someone said Christ didn't die to keep us physically well Christ didn't die to keep us from dying in this world. We're all going to die, okay? And sometime 
people get mad at God for certain things. That's not the purpose that he came. He will be with us, but we will walk with him through the valley of the shadow of death because that's what this world is. Now, if we start thinking, oh, this world is more, then we're going to drift from God and we're going to use our Christianity to make money or to do something else to make us happier. And so I think this is a real telling scripture that we went through, and that's why I, I did this little chart, because I thought maybe it would be uh, helpful to us. Anybody have any questions on that before we move on? Okay, um, let's look at the next scripture here. Um, I think I go, all right, there's two slides with this, so you, you can look at it in your book if you'd like. For he did not subject uh, to angels the world to come concerning which we are speaking. In other words, this isn't about angels, which were very important to them. But one has testified somewhere saying, now, whenever he quotes a scripture, uh, he never gives the name of the person that did it because he wants everyone to realize it was God in the Old Testament scriptures and in the New Testament. Okay, so sometime, uh, you know, rather than saying David said this, he will say, you know, nothing. And I think that's what he did in this case because he's going to quote Psalms 8. And here it is. And this is one that I know Andy has read for us at times, maybe Mark. What is man that you remember him or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him a, for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, left nothing that is not subjected to him. Now we do not yet see all these things subjected to him, but we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death uh, for everyone. Let me go back. What is he talking about here? Well, it's really a, a double kind of thing here. Of course, David was talking, uh, but he's also uh, talking about man, humanity, but he's talking about Jesus. So let's look at what it says. What is man? What is humanity that you even pay any attention to him? And we should see, you know, if you've ever gone through and done a little exploration by somebody that shows you the universe and all the, the stars and the planets, and Earth disappears in all of that because it's so small versus that. Or you look at our sun and you say, well, that's a pretty big thing. No, no, when you look at the suns that are in the universe, they make that, you can't even see it as a dot. When you go through the universe and all the things that he's created, it's very easy to say, I am nothing. I am a molecule sitting here, you know, but not true. It asks, what is man that you remember him or the son of man, Jesus, that you are concerned about him? So he puts both mankind and Jesus into the same phrase because Jesus represents mankind. Jesus is the last Adam, right? You've heard that before. Uh, and so it said you have made him or Jesus for a little while lower than the angels. And in the same way, for those who are saved, who those are in Christ, they are for a little while lower than the angels. What does that mean? Angels don't die. He made God into a body that dies. Angels don't. They have a body that can, that can move very rapidly and can do so many things, but he constrained Christ in this body like ours. We are truly brethren of Jesus, even though he is our God. So a little while lower than the angels, but of course, uh, only a little while, both of us. So we will 
uh, we will uh, draw near to God. He, he uses the angels to help us. He doesn't use us to help the angels. So one day we will be greater than the angels. Uh, so now he starts talking about things. See, to God, it's not like, well, this is in the past and this is in the future. It's all one thing. And someday, maybe to us, we'll be able to understand what it means uh, to not have to look at time or past, present, future, those kind of things. So he goes on and says, you have crowned him. Of course, he's talking about Jesus with glory and honor. I didn't see that. I don't see that. I can't see it. Okay, all I see is Jesus because of his word. And I see that through faith. You have appointed him over the works of your hands, over the works of God's hands. Well, I kind of know that, but I don't see it yet. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. I don't really see everything in its subjection under Christ's feet. But we do see him. That's what we get to do. Someday, we will see all the other stuff. But right now in St. Louis, we open our Bible and we see Christ. We see uh, him in the scriptures and we see him by faith, right? And one day, all these things of glory we're going to see. But right now, we see Jesus. You know, there's uh, some pulpits um, I don't know how many there are, but I've seen them, where behind there, as a message to the preacher, it says that they may see Jesus. That's what they say. So that when you get up there to preach, the first thing you do is look down. That's your purpose. You're trying to help them to see Jesus. And it comes from God's word. And he says, he finishes off by saying, we do, do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. One of the things, uh, if you look in the blue in the middle, you'll see these are the eight things that from this verse to the end of the chapter, it's going to tell us. First of all, to fulfill God's purpose for man. That's what we're seeing right here. He was made a little lower than the angels, put subject to a body that dies so that he might uh, follow this plan of salvation, that we might have redemption through him. Uh, and the second one is to taste death for all. You see, uh, he tasted death so we don't have to. Now you say, well, we're gonna die, right? Well, there's different views of, it talks about, he says, and, and when you die, you, you live. So there's a very good possibility, and I think I've told some people dying, that this is probably gonna be, it's not gonna feel like death. Once, once you're out of this body, it's life. Some people say, well, you know, uh, the dying, the, the people that are dying are going to go to a new place uh, and uh, um, to, a, to a place of death, to a place of sleep, to a place of the dead. But it's just the opposite. We are dying and we are going to transition to a place of life, of real life. And so uh, I think that's what he's, he's talking about here. In Luke 20, it says, uh, Jesus said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy, those who are saved, to attain to that age and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. So that's what we're going to do later. We're not going to be married when we're in heaven, for they cannot even die anymore. We won't be able to die anymore. It will be similar to the angels, and that's where some people say, well, we're going to be an angel. We're not going to be an angel. We are God's sons and daughters and redeemed in Christ, okay? But there, it says, because they are like angels in some ways and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. 
So some people get that, that we're going to be angels, but we have to keep the, the clear divide between what angels are. They are messengers for God to help those humans to become sons of God. They are part of the help uh, in all of that. And then um, <clears throat> in Daniel 7, verse 18, but the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one of Christ. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all the dominions will serve and obey him. And that's in the Old Testament. That's Daniel uh, talking about those who are the redeemed uh, and that will be the redeemed. So we continue on. Let's, let's go to the next uh, section here uh, with verse 10. I guess I started here. <coughs> which says it was fitting for him Christ for whom all things and through all uh, whom all things uh, in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through suffering now people say oh you mean Jesus wasn't perfect you had to he had to perfect Christ no uh, he was um, perfectly suited for the gospel's message and be the the lamb of God when he suffered he became suitable for this redemption story so he had to suffer to represent that and we see in this one here more of the family ties because uh, it says here for both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are from one father for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So we are in a way brethren with Christ. Now the Jehovah Witnesses and some will say, you know, well, we're brothers of Christ now and, and uh, you know, he's no higher than we are. But th that's not what this really means. So they, there's a little misinterpretation here. In Psalms 22, which I think he gets that from, I will declare your name to my brothers in the congregation. I will praise you. You don't praise a brother. You praise God. And so um, Psalms 22, if you remember, Christ referred to that on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And so... Uh, it continues on in Psalms 22 where it talks about uh, that we are his brothers. And one note I wanted to show you maybe before we close today. Uh, verse 11 says, for, for both he who sanctifies. Well, if you take, uh, the, uh, if you take an older version uh, of the translation, which happened here in the Atlantic Monthly, there was published uh, the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And this is what it says. It says, In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. And he died to make men holy. That's what this says in verse 11. For both he who died to make men holy is basically what it says. Makes men holy. And that's where we got the battle hymn of the Republican. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free while God is marching on. So we will sacrifice ourselves for his word. Right? And so that's where that uh, battle hymn of the Republic uh, comes from. And then he goes on to finish the, that uh, uh, scripture there. And I think we have uh, one more page after this. Uh, saying, uh, he is not ashamed to call him brethren, saying, and this is from Isaiah 8, I will proclaim your name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. So, you know, um, Jesus is basically saying, I'm going to proclaim my brethren. Okay. In the midst of the congregation. So it kind of switches back and forth. Uh, <clears throat> Isaiah is used there. I will wait for the Lord 
who is hiding his face in the house of Jacob. I will put my trust in him. Here I am, and the children the Lord has given me. We are signs and symbols in Israel from the Lord Almighty who dwells on Mount Zion. And of course, below there is that picture that I love because it shows all of us in Christ. You see, that, that is when we talk about putting the cloak of Christ on and, uh, and the judgment day, God looks down, does not see us on all those pictures. He sees Christ. And we come into glory with Christ. For the rest of the world, they are separate from Christ. He looks and sees all the sinfulness of humanity, of all the others, and says, depart from me. So I'm going to close there, and then we've got like one more page here uh, from Hebrews chapter 2.